Archer believes he solved the problem years ago, but no one seems to have taken him up on it. Well, Nicholas Woolley went to see Captain Morris Seddon and his answer to the big freeze, electric underwear. Oh, good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you found the place. Do come in. Thank you very much. Come, come. Well, as you see, I keep lots of what anybody else here would consider to be junk. Old refrigerators, old motor cars, old motorbikes, all kinds of technical things, which I find useful. I don't waste a thing. And for instance, little mechanical parts out of odd domestic equipment can be used, for example, for restoring part of my old windmill, you see, over there, and that sort of thing. And what, you've got a bike? Yes, indeed. It's, it's a very old motorbike. It's one of uh, two of the more recent of my collection. I have a great many. This is a 1960, sorry, 1955. I also have a, 19, a 1960 DSA, and the two serve for my principal daily transport. You've got a Rolls as well, that seems a bit incongruous. Well, you know, I used to use it. Grandfather was as rich as I am poor, and he used to buy the things in pairs from the works, and his chauffeur, Mac Fee, was Rolls Works train. Can't afford to run it. He does six miles a gallon. Maurice Seddon was born and grew up in a large house in Hampstead, previously owned by the composer Elgar. Maurice's father was an English playboy, his mother a German concert pianist, who after her marriage gave society recitals. When Maurice's father left, the money ran out for coal for the furnaces, the pipes froze, and so did the family. I can understand how you came to be interested at an early age in keeping warm in difficult circumstances. But why are you interested in and a believer in heated clothes? Originally and specifically for use on a motorcycle, because on a motorcycle, which is a cold environment, it's very useful to be able to heat one's entire person. I produce insoles for heating the underneath of the feet, in the same way as an electric heating ring of a cooker would heat the underneath of a saucepan. Is that really practical? Works beautifully. I have them on uh, in my boots, there you see the wires, and this is the plug, which I can plug in to a power supply on a motorcycle, or indeed to a windmill, or to an, a mains transformer in a building, and my feet are beautifully warm from the underneath. And on top of that? Well, the next item would be a pair of heated, in this case, tracksuit trousers, or equally a pair of long heated pants, either will do, with its own lead, and again, I have that on at this moment. When you've got all that gear on, is there any danger that you fry? There's no danger at all of frying, but there is a very gradual rise in temperature. It's almost imperceptible, but the point does come where you get too warm, and therefore this equipment may only ever go into the hands of the compost mentis. It must never go into the hands of senile or lunatic people. Now, what does all this cost? Well, a vest, for instance, sells at £84. A pair of long heated pants is the same price. But if you're relatively poor, is the capital cost worth it? Oh, well worth it, because the energy saving is enormous. Once you have this equipment, you can heat your, keep your body warm for about one twentieth or one thirtieth of the cost of heating a room. I don't know whether you'll think this is a bit of an insult, but I think many people may think that here's a mad inventor. Are you a mad inventor? I am an inventor, and I think I may be described as eccentric in that the things I do are different from the things done by other people. But in every case, these differences are based on sound. Last well, week I went to tea with a man I'd heard about in Datchet, who is half British and half German. Not surprisingly, he's an inventor and an eccentric. Captain Morris Sudden is obsessed with both health and power conservation, as I discovered once I found my way through the front garden and asked him for a cup of tea. Now, I'm clearly not going to get a cup of tea in here, am I? That's what I came for, and it's not going to happen. Well, everything you see in this house, including even the beverages, are eccentric, but with very good reason. Does that include you? Oh, I, I would think in a lot of respects, absolutely. I do many things based on my own original thought rather than emulating others. In that, too much coffee is bad for the heart, and in that, I am a hyopractica. I'm, I'm, I'm one who is very much concerned with health. I make a mixture consisting of one part of uh, instant coffee, three parts of drinking chocolate. You're going to do that now? Well. Yes. We then add, because of the Dicker Deutsche Bauch, three spoons of skimmed milk powder, not full milk powder. What's the Dicker Deutsche Bauch? Uh, the Dicker Deutsche Bauch is this great fat tummy hanging out here. <laughs> it's quite harmless, I assure you, except that it's medically bad. There it happens. And so to minimize that, I don't use full cream milk. 
Now, I always use honey, which I buy in very large quantities, in drums, which, of course, is pre-digested in the bee's stomach, in the place of sugar, which I consider to be relatively unhealthy, and I do not use sugar. Honey is used as a sweetener for all purposes. <laughs> Dying for a cup of tea at this moment. <laughs> You'll get it in just a minute. And I have no guarantee, have I, that I shall like this. Well, I shall give you just a little rustle to begin with, just in case you don't like it. We don't want to waste it, do we? Waste, not want, not. See it? Which is written over the doorway here, isn't it? Almost. Ergonomically. Yes, absolutely. Good. It's nice. very, very chocolatey. What good news? There's another kind of smell in this kitchen. Now, there are very many smells in here. The predominant one, the paramount one, is that of garlic. I'm constantly using garlic. It's incredibly healthy, but of course the English detest it because it smells. Mm, do you chew it, do you? Yes, I chew it, I chew it raw in the early morning and put it on my breakfast. Mm. Now, people will be wondering why I am dressed in these odd clothes with a lot of peculiar patterns on them and wires everywhere. Why are we wearing this? Well, we're wearing this to demonstrate the usefulness of electrically heated undergarments. This is an undervest, isn't Indeed, it? that is an undervest, and that is a pair of tracksuit trousers. And they would normally be worn underneath or inside outer protective clothing. I can plug in in an unheated room and heat my insoles from an umbilical cord with which I can wander around the room. And this can take its power from the window, which you've seen outside, if there is wind. Energy is spiraling in price from year to year, and energy is becoming increasingly short in supply. And what has been the norm, centrally heat buildings may cease, and we may in future plug in our heated clothing, saving a great deal of energy. If you'll forgive me for saying this, there is a fair amount, I don't mean a fair amount, I mean a great deal, of clutter around here. And do you know where everything is when you're looking for things? I know where all the important things are. I can find everything <laughs> that really matters. <laughs> but this is a real thing. This is Thomas Edison, isn't it? Well, this is great fun. This is a Thomas Alvar Edison cylinder photograph of 1912. Yeah. And it has a collection of German recordings made under the American patents. And this particular one is Tiroler Holzhacker Buben Marsch, the March of the Tyrol Wood Chopping Boys. Well, let's hear a bit of it now, shall we? Right. So <laughs> people I have tea with, with a, with a teapot, and we don't drink tea in your house, so you can brew whatever strange concoction you want, and then pour it into there and serve it out elegantly. Captain Seven, thank you very kindly. Oh, very kindly. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Now, uh, some interesting Morris Sidden, Travelers Royal who Signals retired, always prepares breakfast in his electric dressing gown. To you and me, perhaps, an unusual idea. But to the captain, it's simply a sensible solution to the problem of staying warm on frosty mornings without the bother of getting fully dressed. Captain, where did you first get the idea of electric clothing? Well, it takes me back very many years. 
around 1951, being a very keen motorcyclist, um, having also relatives, being half German, living in cold places in the North German plain, being also an electronics engineer and having the necessary knowledge, I evolved a whole range of heated clothing purely to keep myself warm on my own motorcycle journeys. And also for domestic use, I see, by your electric uh, dressing gown. Oh yes, I believe in economy. Uh, as a bachelor, I don't need to consider the needs of other people in the house. I have a windmill at the bottom of the garden which generates energy, and the more wind there is, the more energy I get free. And I simply heat my person instead of the room. Now, what is it you've got on now? Well, I'm wearing a heated pair of tracksuit trousers and a heated vest. The heated tracksuit trousers are an alternative to heated long pants. And you will notice that there is heating on the sleeves as well as on the body. There's no danger with this sort of clothing, is there? None whatever, because the supply is 12 volts, and from 12 volts you cannot get a, a shock. A shock presupposes a fairly high voltage of 70 volts or more. And you can move your body quite freely? Oh, perfectly freely, absolutely. I can move it in any direction I want. Uh, and this is very much wet weather clothing as well as cold weather clothing. In fact, in the British climate, it is more use in the wet weather than in the cold weather. And what goes on next? Well, the next thing I do is to put on my trousers. Now, you will so see that dropped down through the trousers are the insoles, which hang out at the bottom. There is one, there is the other. Well, they go in your boots, do they? They go in the boots. And the two cables from the insoles convert to the plug, which comes out at the top of the trousers. It's, one has to be a little careful, of course, to do this in the right sequence. But it's not particularly difficult once you're used to it. You get into the trousers. It must well, be a problem if you have to go to the loo. No, not really, oh, no. That's quite simple. When you want to go to the loo, you simply drop your trousers in the normal way. I see there is my heated um, vest, over which, if I want to, I can put a pullover. But normally, it's perfectly adequate. You can travel very lightly clad with this system. I would normally just put a normal leather motorcycle jacket over the top of that. Perhaps it's better to call this heatable clothing rather than heated clothing. Because many people are surprised to see that I wear this throughout about two-thirds of the year. And really, the reason is very simple. If the weather changes at night or in the early morning, then if I want to, I can heat myself. So you're not always turned on, is it? Oh, uh... By no means. I have the facility of turning on if I wish to. I'm now going to plug in the heated vest into the socket labelled body. I'm now going to plug in the heated pants into the socket marked legs and I'm now taking the heated insoles and plugging them into the socket that was formerly labelled feet the label I'm afraid has fallen off, they're very old now I have control switches for my feet for my hands for my body and for my legs they're now all turned on but initially I would only use the feet and the hands so I turn off the body and I turn off the legs what would you say to those who might suggest you make somewhat of a fetish of body warmth? Um, I would say that that is a, not a sensible remark because in a climate as damp as the British one, the endothermic effect caused by the evaporation of the rainwater, which is constantly descending upon us, is so great that it is extremely unhealthy. It lowers the body resistance and predisposes one to catch all manner of infections and illnesses. You'll not be surprised to learn that one of the panniers on Captain Seddon's bike is in fact a motorised crockpot. Toss in the raw ingredients of a stew before you set out and you have a piping hot meal a hundred kilometres later. All that, plus the warmth of electric long johns. This is Paul Lynham with a very warm Captain Morris Seddon for Newsworld. When a man cuts his heating bills by wearing a windmill-powered electric dressing gown, you might assume that he's reached the outer limits of eccentricity and frugality. But that would be to underestimate Captain Morris Seddon, Royal Signals retired, a man who brings new meaning to that old motto, waste not, want not. Take food, for example. The captain, a diet-conscious bachelor, lives on the leftovers from a friend's health food restaurant, which he stores in vast quantities in a series of freezers in his yard. And with more than a hundred herbs in his kitchen, his menu is infinite. 
including greeny brown scrambled eggs, and everything is garnished with raw garlic. My English relatives and friends abhor me for the stench that I create. But I'm not interested in that because I know the immense value of garlic to our health. Well, bon appétit. Merci beaucoup. On mange ça pour la santé, ça fait très bien. The captain was born into an immensely wealthy Anglo-German aristocratic family and spent his childhood in the London mansion formerly owned by the composer Elgar. But a bitter divorce left mother and son virtually penniless, and today the rare 1934 Rolls Phantom, which sits in his shed, is one of his few mementos of those golden years before frugality became a way of life. Nowadays, apart from selling electric clothing, he repairs electronic equipment in a workroom of indescribable disorder. And because he can never throw anything away, he has a unique collection of antique equipment. What sort of things do you have here? Well, there's a very old phonograph, a cylinder phonograph of 1912, an Edison phonograph. Would you like to hear it? Yes, sure. It still works, doesn't it? Still works. We start it by releasing the brake, and uh, we then lift the sound box onto the cylinder. These are German recordings made under the American papers. And this is Tiroler Holzhacker Bubenmarsch, the march of the Tirol wood chopping boys by Johann Strauss Orchestra, conducted by Johann Strauss Jr. It's an entirely acoustic recording, without electrical intervention whatever. Entirely done by air pressure waves, vibrating a stylus and a membrane up and down, incising on a hill and dale a vertical recording system, as distinct from the gramophone, which is used as horizontal or lateral recording. Could we hear the gramophone now? Yeah. Yeah, even there was a, a cow mooing recorded there. A cow? A cow on that machine. Now, I regret that... This was presumably a cow that was watching the wood-chopping boys march, was <laughs> I imagine. Now, good as the phonograph was, I must warn you that the gramophone is in extremely bad condition, and the reproduction is quite appalling. It is a 1914 Decker dulcophone of the type which was used by the troops in First World War, World War I, as the first welfare gramophone. It was issued in quantity. Sounds like it was designed to drive them out of the trenches. I think it must have been. Thank God for high fry, eh? Absolutely. <laughs> and what's this one here? Well, this is an old wire recorder, which is the forerunner of the modern tape recorder. Recordings were made on a very thin stainless steel wire, which has the characteristic that it very easily gets broken, and the only way of jointing it is by knotting. And the reef knot, one hopes, will pass through the recording playback head. Shall we see if we can make it play? It has on it a recording taken off the BBC on wire. And there's a little yes, wire here, is there? That's the wire, and it passes from this roller, from this reel through the recording playback head onto the take-up roller there and it has a radio recording on it taken many many years ago probably 30 years ago This is a recording made at Eton College by a choral society at Eton College many years ago. Viewing this eccentric collection, I wondered whether the captain considered himself to be an eccentric character. I think many people think of me as an eccentric, which doesn't worry me in the least bit. I have interests which are very much my own. Um, I have never been a person who necessarily... Um, follows the example of the broad mass of the human race. Rather, I use my brain in order to decide what course of action to me seems best. And having logically concluded what that course is, I then follow it. Um, a very typical example, when I go out at night into the roads, which in this village are ill-lit, I quite normally put a lamp, what a pity I haven't got it with me to show you, a lamp on my forehead, operated by a small accumulator, either carried in a, in a pouch on a belt or put in a pocket. 
this when you're walking about, is it? Oh, yes. If I go to the letterbox, a distance of 100 metres, where there is a great danger of pedestrians being run down in the dark, I consider all pedestrians should be illuminated. But in that I do this, and no one else does it, however sensible it may be. The people round about look at me in absolute amazement, as though I was somebody who'd come from Mars, merely because I have a light on my head. The captain, glowing with garlic and the warmth of his electric clothing, deplores the waste of today's consumer society. And he's convinced that eventually his approach will be seen not as eccentric, but as logical and useful. And if he's wrong, well, that doesn't matter. For Captain Morris Seddon, Royal Signals retired, is having far too much fun to care about the opinion of the now world. Now, our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, I first Paul... met, uh, as it were, on the radio a couple of weeks ago on the telephone, and so many people have asked to meet him on the Late Late Show. And he is a man who comes to us from, from England, and he is a captain, a retired captain from the army, and he was talking to me on the, late, on the radio program about the clothes which he makes, which are self-heating. That is to say, from his experience on motorbikes, he actually makes clothes which have electrical elements within them which heat up the whole body. And and they can be used at home as well, because he reckons that heating a room is the uneconomic way to do it. You just heat yourself and you save fuel. Out. Would you welcome, please, Captain Morris Set? Captain Morris Set, here he is. There you are, if you would put over there. Thank you. Fine. Now, you may wonder why he's in motorcycling gear and levers and so on, but I'm right in saying, am I not, Captain Seddon, that in fact, um, they are the heated clothes. Indeed they are. I make heated garments for all parts of the human body, <clears throat> originally purely for myself, starting about 32 years ago, and nowadays, of course, they sell to other people too. To motorcyclists, to all sorts of medical cases, to people who suffer from Raynaud's disease and other circulatory derangements, to paraplegics, to rheumatics, to arthritics, and indeed to people who just want to keep themselves warm in their home with a very great saving of fuel. Now, just let me interrupt you, and if you would sit down, please, in your leathers, because the plugs hanging out of your leathers, they plug into your motorcycle when you're riding. Is that true? They do indeed. Those yes. plugs plug in. Yes. In, into your motorcycle. Indeed. And then you take current from the dynamo of a 500cc 1956 BSA, and, and they, they heat internally. They heat the clothes internally. Yes, they do indeed. They don't only heat me, I hasten to add. These are in use on countless, perfectly standard modern motorcycles. Uh, predominantly, of course, Japanese, because most of the motorcycles today, regrettably, are Japanese. They're in use on German BMWs. They even work perfectly well, to my great surprise, on the six-volt East German and Czechoslovakian CZs and MZs. Um, so even in the coldest of weather, between the leathers which you're wearing and the boots which are also heated and the insoles for the shoes and so on between the whole lot and the gloves you are kept perfectly warm on the motorcycle yes absolutely um, in the case of the smaller motorcycles it's only possible to operate heated gloves which as you see are very very thin inner gloves electrically wired yes and they are worn directly on the hands underneath or if you like inside the ordinary motorcycle outer gloves on the larger motorcycles, it is also possible to use heated insoles, which, as you see, are hand-sewn. Yes. I'm half German, alles Handarbeit, very expensive in 1984. It's yes. done by women with needles and thread. It cannot even be done with a sewing machine. It isn't possible. And on the even larger machines, I'm sorry, this is slightly dirty because it's been used on the t television in Britain as well and got slightly soiled. On the bigger motorcycles you can use heated vests with long heated sleeves and also heated, for example, heated tracksuit trousers. There are also available heated long pants. Yes, and would you use these at home, Captain Seddon? Oh, indeed. Yes. If, for example, you live on your own, as I do, and you wish to be sparing and parsimonious with your energy, and indeed, particularly for people who may be elderly or may be short of money, the concept of heating the body, as distinct from heating the house, is a very viable one because the amount of energy you need to heat your body is a minute fraction of what you would need if you were to heat your room. Indeed. So you plug into the mains, then, and you sit there with the heated... 
Well, you don't quite plug into the mail. Well, you do. I mean, you, 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 you plug, plug in by the way of a transformer. <laughs> you see, there is even May I hold that aloft for the moment. That's your dressing gown. There is my yes. extremely old and very much patched dressing gown. Yes. Twenty years old. Yes. Which, as you see, is lined. Yes. And under or within the lining is indeed a harness of electric wiring, which I hope you can just see it's falling yes. to bits for yes, old age. See that. I'm sure yes. you it still works. Yes, we can see that, yes. Um, and, 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 and you, but you do plug into the mains, do you, you not? You plug into the mains yes. by way of a transformer. Yes. Um, by way of a transformer. And I then, and, and how long do the clothes retain their heat after you have unplugged? Uh, the clothing heats up almost instantaneously when you plug it in. Yes. I don't know why they're laughing. I don't know why you're laughing, you know, because it's a very sound idea and it works very well. As, as I'm glad you find it entertaining, but yes. I do assure you it has a very serious application indeed. Yes. Um, in fact, it enables people to motorcycle who, by virtue of possibly their age or their health, would actually be quite unable to motorcycle without it. Yes. And furthermore, it is actually capable of keeping alive people who, at least in Britain, would be dry, dying of hypothermia because they can't afford, literally, the energy to keep themselves alive in their homes. Yes. I don't know if you have this problem in no. Ireland. No. We have lots of elderly people in Britain who are dying the whole time. This is a statistical fact. They are found dead in their houses because they just cannot afford the cost of fuel today. Yes. Now, where you might use, say, 2,000 watts, to heat even a small room yes. um, with a, perhaps an expenditure of anything between 20 and 80 watts, you can adequately heat the person. Mm. Now, a transformer of about that size can be used satisfactorily with an absolutely minimal expenditure of energy, so small that you can hardly even calculate it, to heat the body. So that with almost non-existent expenditure, the body can be kept perfectly alive and perfectly well in conditions where, with a very small income, it might be just impossible to heat the house and the person might die. Indeed. You let slip something there, Captain. You, you, you say you live alone. You never married. I never married. No. I'm the son of divorced parents yes. and the brother of a divorced sister. And I think it's true to say very often in life you know that truth is stranger than fiction. And we have a very tragic family history. And if you once experienced divorces at close hand, with all the terrible consequences that then are likely to follow, of chronic alcoholism, the dissolution of the home, and all the associated tragedies, one tends to think that there is the probability of the inherited or inheritable predisposition towards divorce and all those consequences. And I prefer not to cause any children to suffer in the way that we suffered as children. And that was a conscious decision, Captain, not to marry, was it? Oh, absolutely. Because of yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Because I would say this to you, not only in our own family is this divorce and its consequences rife, but I see it all round us today in increasing degree in our friends and in our circle of relatives and others. Mm. And um, I think this is uh, its very regrettable. I don't know why it happens, but it does seem to. And and um, I think if there's the likelihood of that at all, it's much better not to involve oneself in marriage and its possible consequences. Yeah. Now, you also told me on the radio that you eat garlic a great deal. Oh, I'm afraid I'm stinking of garlic. If it's yes. very most, I, 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 was, I, was, I was about to mention it, Captain. <laughs> Uh, even from here, yes. What, you f find that garlic is very good for you. Garlic is enormously healthy. I can't tell you how good it is. I'll show you why I've even brought it with me. I never travel very far without it. If I can find it, I will show it to you. But at the moment, I'm having difficulty locating yes, it. Yes, I, I don't have much trouble in locating it myself, uh, Captain. <laughs> even where you are. It's, it's very health-giving, but does it not necessarily follow that you have very few friends? Uh, well, the only friends that I have, perforce, have to be those who recognize the importance of garlic in one's health and who are not um you know, I'm really worried about it. Oh, sorry, I can't that's, find that's it. All right, that's all right, that's all right. That's, that's, that's fine. It shows that God is on our side. It's, or something like that. it's terribly good for our health in many, many different ways. Yes. I'm a herbalist. Yes. 
you would say in German Heilpraktiker, you would probably call it quack. And I have over a hundred herbs in the house, and well over 30 or 35, you know, probably more than that, herbal essential oils. Mm -hmm. And I use them a great deal, and I even provide them for friends and connections. Yes. And are you remarkably healthy? Well, I'm extraordinarily healthy, you know. Yes. At 58, I don't think I'm less healthy than I was at 28. And I use my aged motorbikes for my business going to and from London. I suppose I travel not less than 60 or 80 miles every day on these old things in all weather. Yes. And um, it's partly attributable, of course, to a good mongrel constitution, German, French, English mixed. We are healthy animals. We seldom need the vet. Um, it's certainly largely due to the garlic, which is terribly good. And undoubtedly, it's in no small part due to the many herbs that I use. Yes. I can assure you they're here with me. It's merely that I can't find them. Now, um, uh, German, German, Spanish, did you say? German? No, well, there's even a small Spanish, element yes. of Spanish. So you're very well. good at languages, are you? Well, languages come to me rather automatically. Mm. I was brought up in Hampstead before the war in a rather mm, closed away environment, if you like, with a Schweizerdeutsch Kindermädchen, Ida Braun from Zurich. So my first language was German, with my German mother as well. And later I had a French governess. And then really I first came fully to grips with English as a language rather than as a sort of mishmash at an English prep school at the age of 10. And then it was that I had to learn that one did not say, oh, yes, I aperceive from the French apercevoir, but rather I perceive and other corrections of this kind. Quite, uh, do, you, do you speak Spanish as well? I don't speak Spanish, but I, I made an interesting experiment a few years ago. I wanted to find out the extent to which sleep learning worked. I'm sure you know this method of having yes. tapes that switch on in the night. And I tried the experiment and used Spanish as the test material, it being a matter of no importance to me really whether I should learn Spanish or not. Um, but the interesting result was that at the end of the uh, course of, I think, 44 lessons, I in fact found that I knew the meaning of every word in those 44 lessons, proving the point that the system does work, but I think also proving the point that if one knows Latin and French and Italian, then other uh, Latin languages come quite easily. Quite. And, and you never watch television? No, I never watch television. I'm far too busy. May I quote to you my German-Jewish headmaster and founder of Gordonston School on the subject? Please do. I, 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 I regret to have to say this in such company where television reigns supreme, but uh, he used to say, and I remember very well he said this particular thing, he had certain Steckenfeld, or certain hobby horses that he spoke of, and one of them was, one of the most terrible diseases of the modern world is that of spectatoritis, by which I mean watching others do instead of doing yourself. And it's so true. Quite true. I'm a believer in doing things. I'm always constructing, repairing, modifying, designing, planning, improving. I do a great deal of talking with my clients. They come to see me at all hours of day and night and at the weekend. I have what we call the Deutsche Arbeitslust, the German lust after work. You know, one is at it, uh, particularly in one's own little one-man business, all the time. One almost never stops working except to rest. And so the thought of sitting down, uh, being quite unable to work, by virtue of having to watch a, a bill show a screen, impossible. Mm. I listen to the wireless a great deal because I can work and listen at the same time. Yes, and, but you, watch and, you, the screen, no. and you work all the time in electronics, that is your job, uh, that's your business. Principally in electronics, but I have certain other things too. I have languages which I'm concerned with. Uh, I'm rather keen on old vehicles. I've got a very old Rolls which I can't afford to run anymore, and I've got lots of old motorbikes of the 50s, and they go back to 1928. I've even got electric tricycles of an antique variety. I have a small, a very small, modest, but very interesting and exclusive private museum of very ancient radio and phono equipment. And this is also an interest of mine because I grew up, you know, with yeah. those very old wireless yeah. sets during the war. And, and did you say to Colmer that you take a siesta every day? Oh, yes. I always say that this is something which on the continent is universally understood and made use of. And equally universally, at least in England, completely not understood and not employed. And I maintain that this is a mistake. Every day of my life, whenever it is humanly possible, I make a point of having a siesta in the natural way as an animal after it has eaten a lion or a dog or whatever will go and sleep.
So I do the same thing. The process of digestion is a form of work. Our blood is being sent to the stomach lining to extract the nutrients from the food. And this is work. The heart is working. And if the heart is made to work both at the work of digestion and at some other work simultaneously, this is an overload. It is not wise. It is far better to rest while digesting and then one is refreshed and renewed for the second half of the day. Yes. And, and do, you, do you ever feel, because you're not married and you haven't got the joy of children and so on, the joy of children, um, because, you haven't, because you haven't that, do you miss children? Do you miss... A, I think, oh I sometimes feel it would be nice to have one's olive branches around one, as it were. And this, I think, is a pity. And it is, of course, the price one pays for not marrying. But when I then consider, do excuse me, I'm still looking hopefully for my garlic, which, no, I can't, <laughs> that's not well. uh, It is the price one pays for not marrying, but you know, it's so true, kein schöne Rose ohne Dornen, there is no beautiful rose, but that it has its thorns. And I think there is a beautiful rose in not being married. I mean, after all, here in your country, which is, I believe, largely Catholic, your priests, I believe, do not marry. And there is something to be said for the celibate state, because the celibate can devote himself to whatever he's, he's doing much more fully than the married man can. And therefore, if you wish to devote yourself to something, you have to sacrifice something. And what you sacrifice is not having your olive branches about you. You certainly couldn't eat garlic at the rate you eat it if you were married and had children. <laughs> I, said, I would have to be very selective as to what wife I took. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Brenda, does anything occur to you? You, you met Captain Seddon earlier on, did you not? Yes, I, I find that you're one of the rarest people who truly seem to be happy, and happiness is so rare. If you were to find happiness, how would you define it? I suppose happiness depends very largely on <coughs> making sure that one's life is filled with doing those things that one really enjoys doing. And it's my impression that particularly in the modern world, with, with the pressures that are around us, a very large number of people are engaged in activities which perforce they do for economic reasons, but which possibly they don't enjoy one little bit. They may find it a complete bore. Now, being the chiropractica that I am, I take a great interest in many facets of quack medicine. And I feel perfectly certain that people who are under the stresses which unsympathetic employment must bring about. Surely these people cannot, in the true sense of the word, be healthy. Um, the stresses produce also physical effects. And these physical effects associated with the unhappiness can produce premature illness, can even lead to cancer, and can produce indeed death at quite an early age. I have always made a point of doing the things that I love. I've always been mad on wireless. Excuse me a moment. Already in Gordonston School during the war, I was permitted to found the Wireless Experimenting Club, which didn't exist before my advent. I was permitted to found a motorcycle club in the junior school, which had not existed before my advent. These were both things with which I was passionately interested. And when the time came that one had perforce to do military service because the war was on, dear Kurt Hahn said to me, do not wait until you are conscripted. You must volunteer for something at which you are good and for which you are useful. And Royal Signals is obviously the thing for you. So I was put quite rightly into Royal Signals. And in due course, I was persuaded to become a regular officer in that field because I was technically gifted and I was able to instruct the young officers in the School of Signals in a subject that was dear to my heart and that I knew through and through. Now, again and again, uh, relatives of mine and friends have tried to push me into taking sort of white-collar employment as the employee of some large and highly respected, nationally known company. I've always declined these things. And I you lead your life as you see fit yourself, Captain, absolutely. and do what you want to do. That's right. It's a very good recipe, and I guess it works very well for you. It's a very modest one. It produces very little money, but I enjoy what I do. Indeed, and you harm nobody. 
Exactly. On the contrary, I benefit many. I benefit many with my heated clothing. Indeed. And with many other things. Yes, and it, is the heat of clothing going well for you? I mean, is it selling well? It, it, it. Well, I must tell you something that may surprise you. The media is principally interested in me, as I see it, or very largely because of my heated clothing. Yes. But the interesting fact is that financially, this side of my occupation is a loss. It runs at a loss, so that my accountant is quite angry and wants me to shut it down. I wouldn't dream of doing so, because I would regard it as wrong to shut down a hospital that runs at a loss, immoral, and it would be morally wrong to shut this down. It renders such a good service. The thing that I live on is my electronic work with communications equipment and with high-fidelity equipment. Well, I said to you on the radio, I thought you were a splendid man, and having met you, I still think you're a splendid man, and uh, I think you have the secret. Uh, you, 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 it, is it short, darling? Because I must, I must go now. We're just running out of time. Yeah. Where his insulated clothing can be bought. His insulated clothing can be bought direct from him. You may discuss direct it with him. Direct from oh, him, see. and you may discuss it with him later. All right. All right. Thank you for joining in. Have to go, darling. Must, must go. Swedish TV. I'll be with you in two minutes. Thank you very much, Captain. Oh, they're warm. Warm gloves, electrically heated gloves. But, uh, but how do you, how do you, oh, they're very nice to wear, but I can't get my fingers into them. There's <laughs> <laughs> something, oh, oh that's I That's what see. they look like when I they're see. old. And they're that's what they look like when they're new. Oh, yes. Furthermore, the energy often in winter is derived from the windmill. The more the storm wind, the more the electricity which comes to me gratis. And so much of the heating can be accomplished without any expenditure. That's a heated vest. Yes. With the cord coming out at the waistline and with heated mm. sleeves, as you see. And is of the greatest use to people who are working or living in cold mm. places. Mm. Also to motorcyclists and to many medical cases. Yes. And these are the pants that go with it. And these are heated trousers. Mm. Um, again, with the cord coming out at the yes. waistline. You see, I can heat my body by plugging that mm. into this lead. But then you have to sit still all the time. No, I have a length of wire which yeah. will reach throughout the room. Yeah. See, a fairly long lead so I can move around. <laughs> and if I plug myself in, there are my feet, there is my body, and there are my legs. I can now keep perfectly comfortable and healthy and fit mm. in a cold environment without heating the room. Watching your home one can't uh, help uh, feeling that you are kind of an eccentric man. Well, some people seem to think that. Do you think that yourself? Well, I leave it. I think one has to leave that to others to decide. Mm -hmm. In so far, of course, one is eccentric. Mm -hmm. That one does things which differ from the things done by others. But as I repeatedly say, in every case, these differences are based on sound logical reasoning. Um, I think we tend to live in a very stereotyped world these days, probably because of television and things of this sort, that everybody more or less does the same as their neighbours do. Uh, possibly I should add that I never ever watch television, or practically never, I mean once in a blue moon. <laughs> When you were young, you were, uh, lived in a very rich family, and now you lead quite a different life. Which do you prefer, actually? I have much more sense of fulfillment in what I'm now doing. Mm -hmm. Riches do not bring happiness. Mm -hmm. One must have enough money to pay one's bills, but not so much that one doesn't need to work. Mm -hmm. ah. Right, so you must excuse me, I must find out what that is. Me <clears throat> Who is there? 
Hallo? Wannehmen? ものがあるでしょうね。ああ、すごい。They でも、これは落ちるお家ですね、ここは。50年前のものですよ。こちらは台所。おやおや、いろんな瓶が並んでいます。<笑> セトンさんはやっぱりあんま今先にあの庭を見てきたけれど、え、自然食だけしか食べてないみたい。え、ここ見たらあの何百種類もえ、薬草があるのね。で、今その薬草を使ってえ、コーヒー、コーヒーではない
Vorsicht! Vorsicht, du Arme, weg! Raus! Vorsicht! Hello, Do Captain. please come in. Do please come Hello. in. Lovely to meet you. How nice to meet you. And you. And what a charming headgear you have. It quite oh, takes me back you. to my early childhood. I remember the female <laughs> relatives used to wear them. Oh, thank you. I love hats, actually, but I'm so cold. If you don't wear oh, them, I, I am keep it all so on. sorry. You should you have my heating apparatus. I plug myself in and keep beautifully warm in the coldest weather. Are you plugged in now? No, no, no I'm no. not, but I can plug in. Look, because you're remarkable. I like your waistcoat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do like it. Is this your car? Yes, indeed. It's a marvellous how old would this be? Well, this was made in 1934. Yes. It's uh, Phantom II. It's a six-cylinder engine, 7,668 cc, a straight six, mm. uh, water-cooled with dual ignition, so if either ignition yes. fails, the machine runs on. In grandfather's day, <coughs> these machines were very much a part of the tradition of the family. Yes. And he was as rich as I am poor, and he normally bought them in pairs from the works. Mm. And I'm afraid that his chauffeur, Maxie, who was works trained and who took an interest in the car, would be absolutely horrified at the turn in his grave if he saw the neglect to which, regrettably, it is exposed today. Why do you neglect it? Well, you see, the pressures of daily life are such, and one has to earn such a relatively awful amount of money to pay one's bills these days, that one is working non-stop on whatever projects the business requires. A thing like this, which is nothing more, let's face it, than a dinosaur, is not really a thing that one can afford to spend time messing about but with. But you wouldn't think of selling it. Oh, God, no, let us go. I'm very poor. I have very little money. And the day will come when I'm old and gaga, God willing, and perhaps uh, when I can't earn my living anymore. And at that, that point, it will have to be sold, do you right. see? And whatever money it brings, it will, we hope, will then keep me in my old age. Mm. Just occurs to me to change the subject. I don't yes. know, would you like something to eat? Are you sure? Of course. Delighted. Thank Shall you. we go and look at the freezers? Yes. They're uh, full of all sorts of amusing things. Let me just... Open. the garden? Oh, yes, they live out in the garden. Here, we've got human foodstuffs. We're well, not frozen human. Not frozen <laughs> human. Uh, for example, we have residues from that excellent vegetarian restaurant near London Bridge, who are friends of mine, my oh. clients. The, and I'm at the receiving end of their unsold foodstuffs. Oh. And this is some sort of quasi-soup, which has been deep-frozen and brought to Datchet. Would you like to try some? I would, actually, because I am cold, so yeah. have, this would be hot soup. Oh, oh yes, we lovely. thought Thank it you. would taste delicious. Here is another example of remnants from the same vegetarian restaurant. I really, I'm not even sure what that is. It's like it might, cabbage. It might be cabbage, or it could be onions. Do mm. you eat lots of onions? I can smell onions yes, and garlic. Yes, I'm full of garlic. You can smell it streaming out of my water. mouth. <laughs> yes. It's delicious stuff. It's so good. Um, we have doggies in another freezer. Let's close that one. Mm. Now, it's here so you see, this is a separate category of frozen food, and there you see oh. all sorts of remnants Goodness. from the butcher, all sorts of mm. pigs, legs, and uh, ribs, and bones, and pieces. Oh, I just think it's really horrible in there. Well, I don't really know whether it's that or not. It might be something else. Like frozen it's willy. It's you horrible. You see, we get bits of every bit that the butcher can't sell mm. comes to me in huge quantities, weights of 80 and 90 pounds. Oh! That's quite difficult. You're uh, enjoying this bit. It doesn't want to come out. I'm like, sorry. It's all right. Shall we shut Lovely. this thing down again? And these... These batteries here, are these for the, um... Well, these, pictures? as you see, the date is on them, May 1952, are the newest of my windmill energy storage batteries. The other ones are in there. They're even much older. And there you see the windmill over there. When there's a wind, I get energy gratis. And that saves electricity, after all. Goodness. Now, shall I take that in? Would that be a good idea? And heat it up? Lovely. And then we can have a little something uh, to nibble. Lovely. I'll take it upstairs. Thank you. Shall I wait here for you? Yes, do. And you'll give me a squeal? I'll give when you a call when it's ready. Lovely. Oh, if that soup's as frozen as I am, it's going to take hours to thaw out. Freezes in the garden. Almost in the greenhouse. I'd love to get a dustpan and brush to this lot. Vintage car and a vintage 
Strange motorbike. Goodness. Look at all these wires. Oh, this is what he must plug himself into. Looks dangerous to me. Oh, that must be him in his workshop. Yes, yes, indeed. I've just been, um, looking at your motorbike. Oh, yes. How did you enjoy the motorbike? Was it amusing? It is amusing. Are you ever stopped by the police when oh, you're... Occasionally. Right? They're curious. It looks so old and so dirty and, and so the, scruffy. And all they the think, wires. They think there must be something the matter with it. And then I show them that it's all mechanically perfect and regularly maintained. I do not allow my mechanic to waste his time, which is my money, <laughs> cleaning a motorcycle. Um, Captain Seddon, do you need a lot of money to live? Um, very little. Please, I live on a very humble scale, and I make most of my living out of the repair of radio telephone equipment mm. and high fidelity amplifiers and tape recorders and things of that sort. You always enjoy this. Oh, it fascinates me. Mm. Quite fascinating, you know. One, it's, this is the sort of work for which you have to be quite on your own and you have to spend... I'm sorry, I'm here, Captain Seddon. Not at all. I don't mind a bit if you don't mind my poring over these things. Mm. Ah, there's a signal there. Mm -hmm. Not quite so good at that point. Oh, look at this. This is your museum. Yes, it really is. It's my little private museum of oh, ancient yes. wireless and gramophone equipment. Look at the little needle tins. Oh, aren't they lovely? sweet? Have you seen that? Oh. His master's voice. I remember that clearly. Oh. And do these all go? Quite a number of them work. It's a 1912 Edison cylinder phonograph. It works. A 1914 Decker dulcophone gramophone, oh. for which you can see the publicity on the wall of the period. And these little tiny ones here, little junior thing yes, here. Yes, little junior and Decker. Go. And, well, I'm not quite sure how well this one goes. Now, I'm going to play you an old HMV, his master's voice here. Uh, just one second. Uh, yes, that's the one we wanted, isn't it? Yes, it's the one we had before. Let's see what it sounds like. Uh. For tango, Morris. <laughs> yes. Quite a romantic old record. It's lovely. And is this as loud as it can go? Oh, yes. And if you want to shut it down, you have to take a sock and literally put it in the hole. And that must be where the expression of putting a sock in it came from. Really? Yes. No electronics at all. Thank goodness. Acoustic. Smashing. Shall we see how our mixture is getting on? Oh, it smells lovely. That's that herbal really? mixture I told you about from the vegetarian restaurant. Oh, I hope it'll lovely. be good. It comes out of the freezer. I'm ready for that. I'm freezing. Do take yourself a seat, please. Ooh. I drove your coat. Yeah, you better try my heated gloves. Now, let me see heat it. They go to motorcyclists, invalids, uh, elderly lovely. people, people with circulatory problems. And that's what this is all about. Yes, that's what all this is about, you see. Oh, and that's where the plugs are for on your motorbike. That's Those what you plugs, join yourself on. They plug into the motorbike, and you see, I can keep myself warm. I'm wearing heated clothing underneath my outer garments. There, I plugged in the very old plug for my body, mm. the plug for my legs, and indeed the plug for my feet. And oh. when I'm in on my own in this kitchen and don't need heat for anybody else, I'm blissfully warm yes. in an unheated environment. But I do have to take a little care of my umbilical cord yes. as I walk around the kitchen. That's lovely. Pianists, concert pianists would like these, surely. Oh, well, yes, they? absolutely. Warming I suppose they'd there. have to take it off to play. But yes, but, you know, to warm up their hands. I'm sure, ideal, yes. Morris, my hands are lovely, but my feet froze. I'll have to go and get the insoles and show you the heated insoles. So I'll unplug myself and I'll go and show you the heated clothing. Captain Seddon obviously likes his herbs. most of them. Oh, I'm starving. Oh, no. This 
room's like the house of herbs, Morris, isn't it? I think it is in many ways. Herbs I've never seen before. Really? Mm. Oh, there's a great recess of herbs. Look this. This is a vest. That is a heated garment, a heated vest. With all this wiring, who does the stitching, Morris? I have seamstresses who do it in their own homes for me, mm. privately. It's done by hand with a needle and thread. Do you ever get metal fatigue with all this? Oh, yes, it's indeed a problem. I will never sell heated clothing to anybody, but that I warn them that the heated clothing suffers in due course from metal fatigue, and they must be practical people who can mend join, mm. mend wires if they break. Oh, this must be lovely. This is the insole, Heizbarer Einlagen, my own invention. Not they go into the boot, again, all hand sewing, as you can see. Mm. They go in the boot underneath the foot. And this wire you see coming out, this plug, is the plug, plug from in. the insole. Um, Morris, excuse me interrupting. I took the liberty of tasting the soup, and it is ready. Oh, yes. Now I think we ought to try that, mm. oughtn't we? I don't know that I would call it a soup. It's a bit solid for that. I think I would call it a sort of iron pot, a one pot. Mm. There is our little iron top. Our one pot is all I ever have time to cook, I'm afraid. You don't like cooking, Morris? No, I just produce those things that look after themselves. And that's about all I can cope with. Do you do much housework at all? Virtually none. Yeah. Almost none. Absolute minimum. You know. do, do help yourself. Oh, I hope the you. iron top will be to your liking. <laughs> it's a very simple vegetarian mixture. Just leftovers of the vegetarian restaurant. Nice I, I think it should be good. Morris, all this wiring you use, is that plugged into your windmill in the yes, garden? Yes, indeed. This wiring you see wherever it is goes to the, the umbilical cord, comes from the windmill batteries. Mm. Mm. Lovely. Very happy. I'm very glad you like it. Celery and lentils. Yes. And um, we've talked about garlic earlier. You know, obviously, it's everywhere. Would you normally be chopping it onto them? Well, I would take a canola like this mm -hmm. and break off one segment. And then, for ease of cutting, I would slice that in two. Mm -hmm. And then I would try and take the skin off, which is often rather difficult. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. And then, I would very carefully slice it finely. Note that it is raw. Now, oil of garlic, being volatile, evaporates with the heating action of cooking. Therefore, if you cook garlic, half the goodness goes away in the vapour. Would you like some? May I give no, you some? No, no, no. no, thank you. No. Very, very good. Aren't you worried about losing your friends, though? Well, the only friends I can have are those who are as sensible as Likewise. I am and accept garlic. At every meal, I have my garlic. And quite honestly, I used to hate it in 1938 when I first tasted it mm. in France. But now I'm so addicted to it, I couldn't bear a meal without my garlic. It's absolutely delicious. Everything tastes quite tasteless without it. And bear in mind, salt, which is so bad, mm -hmm. is replaceable with garlic in a healthy way. Captain said, I've had a lovely day. Can I wash up for you? My dear, I wouldn't dream of letting oh. you do it. Not at all. No, no, no sir. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Zane, I'll school to. I don't know what that means. <laughs> All good things to you, and I hope to see you again. I hope so, too. Thank you. Because I'm going to get down to the corner telephone, and I'll ring up and say that I'm locked out. Perhaps I can get a lift. Let's see. Hello. Would you like a lift? Oh, that's very kind of you, but I was rather hoping to go in a car. You see, it's freezing cold out here and I don't want to catch a cold. My dear, you won't get cold with me. I invent and make electrically heated clothing of all kinds. Well, who are you? Gloves. Who are you? I'm Captain Morris Seddon. How do you do? Well, how do you do? I'm Ethel and this is my house, number 73. Look, Look good. Captain Seddon, you've got to be serious about this heated clothing because I'm, you know, I've been freezing all morning. What, what are the gloves then if they're heated? Well, they're plugged in here and they're heated all over. Have a look. You so are? what are these electric wires that you've got here? Well, the wiring generates heat and keeps the hands beautifully warm. And that's plugged into the electrical equipment on the bike? There is the socket and the plug. Yeah. And there is the switch. It's all labelled. So you've got the labels for all different parts of the body? That's right. Foot. And what's this one here? Body. Yeah. Legs. Hands. What's the one for the nose? The nose. That's for the heated breathing mask. It goes over the face, over the nose and mouth, and protects against emphysema and bronchitis. So look, I'm, I'm going to be a bit personal now, if you don't. I know we've only just met, but uh, have you got wires going all over your body? I'm wired all over. Really? Did you invent this yourself? Yes. I invent and make heated clothing for every part of the body. Heated vests, 
heated pants. The vests have long sleeves, heated tracksuit trousers and tracksuit jackets. That's extraordinary, but the place that I really get In cold is my feet. Ah. Have you got something for that? Yes, I'll show you that. Extraordinary. What sort of people would wear these? Well, these are used by creative artists, by sportsmen, by uh, wheelchair invalids, by the elderly, the infirm, by people like me who want to save a great deal of money on fuel and energy by heating their bodies and leaving their houses cold. You lose a lot less energy. Well, what happens if you get wet? If you get wet, nothing at all. You're wet and you're beautifully warm. It's like having your hands or your feet in a bowl of warm water. All you need is something to cook your dinner on while you're going along. Well, we've even got that, believe it or not. I, I'm not, I think I probably do, actually. Well, here is the gadget, an electrically heated cooking pot, which cooks the food as the bike runs along the road. I should, do, I should put your gloves on, it's cold out here. Very good that idea. Is, listen, you couldn't give me a lift down to the uh, local call box, Yes, could you? of course I will, oh, yes. That would be splendid. You see, I've been locked out all morning. I just pop that away in your pannier, if that's all right. Can I put this uh, helmet on? Yes, you put that on. Leg. Heated cooking pot keeps the food as you go along. Uh -huh. You can stop and have your food even though all the cafes are closed. Well, can you start your bike up? Yes. Why did you think of it in the first place? Well, well I what, just, let's push it I down here out the way because the neighbours hate the sound of the motorcycle. Let's push it away. And uh, there we go. And we started up a bit because I've had terrible trouble with 75. Ethel! Eth Ethel! Oh, she's really going round the bend, you know. Oh, no, she's not. She's not. She stopped at the lights. Better go after so, See you in a bit. Leaves me with a slight lead of two to one, but I think I'm going to totally baffle the panel with our next guest. Let's give him a warm welcome, please, with a man with an extremely unusual secret, as you'll see very shortly. Here he is, contestant number four tonight on I've Got a Secret. <laughs> ah, you'll understand why we're smiling in a moment, because Morris is from Datchet. And Morris is extremely unique, and you'll see why. If you're playing the game at home, close your eyes. But those who aren't, you're going to see it on your screens right now. <laughs> right, well, for the benefit of the panel, Morris is currently enjoying this. <laughs> and it's Angela to start. <laughs> currently enjoying what, Morris? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I suppose one could say one's enjoying the concept of the entertainment that one's giving. <laughs> no fear at all. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where Datchet is. Is this Datchet is a small, urbanite, rapidly urbanising village. I see. About one and a half kilometres from Windsor. No, no, that's quite enough. Police. No, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> because you're the cat that's had his cream. I'm awfully sorry, I didn't understand that. <laughs> We're looking very I'm smug. Like Angela, absolutely nowhere. Angela thinks we're looking very smug. I think we are as well. Derek. Uh, Morris, are you a, an army man, former army man? I am a retired regular officer, yes. I see. And is your secret something to do with the army? Um, no, it isn't. Although... And it's happening at this moment, currently enjoying... Right this minute, yes. Is it the current, as in electricity current? Electricity undoubtedly enters into the subject. <laughs> He's a good talker, isn't he? <laughs> Annika, well done. Currently enjoying this. You're not sitting on one of those cushions that were. <laughs> no, I'm afraid I'm not. Mm. Is it something to do with the electronics here in the studio in front of us? No, no, not at all. Have you got something under your jacket you should tell us about? <laughs> yes, but you've got to find out for yourself. OK. No, 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 no. <laughs> Cue the helicopter. <laughs> is it uh, in one of your suit pockets? No, it's not in one of my pockets. It's obviously not a very big no, piece of equipment. Quite, that, isn't quite, that isn't quite accurate. A small part of it, which would not normally be there, is at this moment in my pocket. <laughs> no, no, that's totally confusing. Alan. Morris, have you designed your own electrically heated underwear? <laughs> Indeed. I saw his hand in his pocket. Keep it warm. <laughs> You've done ever so well. I didn't think you'd get it, actually, the way you, you were all travelling. But it, it, that's true. Captain Morris Seddon here is actually wearing electrically heated underwear, Did which you? you designed yourself. Yes, indeed. 
And, what uh, if you go swimming with it? I, I beg your pardon? <laughs> Whether one goes swimming in it? Yes. Amongst the many users, there are some who use them in conjunction with something they call a woolly bear, which is some sort of undersea device. Oh, I've got a woolly bear. You have, so you know all about it, much more than I do. Well, tell us the other applications. I mean, apart from keeping yourself warm, give us the other applications. Well, you see, I invent and make, on a very small scale, very high-quality, hand-sewn, electrically heated garments, which I have invented, a whole range of these things. It is of the greatest value to all sorts of invalids, but it also is used, of course, by motorcyclists who get cold. I myself am a very keen motorcyclist of 45 years' experience. I have an abominably bad circulation, and this is why 35 years ago I began to evolve this equipment. And it now sells on a very small cottage industry basis to the needy. And of course, your main source of power on the road is your bicycle, which we're bringing out right now. There it is. So there's the bicycle. Let's have a look at the, the underwear now, Morris. Here it is. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> and there you see an electrically heated jacket. I produce electrically heated tracksuit jackets, tracksuit trousers, heated long pants, heated vests with long heated sleeves and bodies, heated well, insoles, heated gloves, and many other heated garments. Let's, let's go to these wires in your pocket now, because these actually are part of the the setup on the bicycle. You can see these are plugs and they've got, you can't probably admit too far, it's got feet and hands and legs and body and they plug into the bicycle which then keeps you warm when you're travelling. You also can cook some things in a little crock pot at the back, aren't you? Yes, I've invented an electrically heated cooking pot which travels in the right-hand pannier and plugs into the socket. You can just see by the oil tank. Oh, yeah? And it cooks goulash, stew and soups. <laughs> So next time you're in a traffic jam and a freezing cold day and a motorcyclist passes you with a grin on his face, it's got to be Morris. <laughs> you, There's nothing unimaginative about our next guest tonight. Um, when he retired from the Royal Signals 30 years ago, he spent the rest of his life doing interesting things with the electricity. And what this man can do with a pair of underpants gives a whole new meaning to the phrase marks and sparks. Would you please welcome <laughs> Captain Morris Seddon. Uh, now, I see on this interesting breastplate it says heated gloves and clothing, which is presumably what you're going to show us now. I see you've got the leathers on. You're not a Julian Coat fan by any chance, right? <laughs> Most awfully sorry, I don't know who he is. Well, I don't watch television, I should I've got an interesting it. photograph of him over there you might oh, like yeah. to see later. <laughs> Tell me, Captain Seven, what are these wires hanging out of your vests for? Well, you see, I invent and make a wide range of electrically heated clothing mm -hmm. for invalids, paraplegics, sclerotics, arthritics, rheumatics, and for motorcyclists, yourself, of course, motorcyclists, creative artists, anybody with a bad circulation, anyone who works in a cold place. So how do these, uh, these heated garments work? Well, this particular lot, I'm also a motorcyclist and have been for over 40 years. I have a jolly bad circulation, and about 35 years ago I began inventing this. It plugs into a 12-volt source, which can be the electrical system of a motorbike, mm -hmm. or the batteries of a wheelchair, or an electrical system of a, any of a kind car. Any kind of small battery, yeah? Any 12 volt source, including little portable German Sonnenschein batteries Tiny. like that, and or a mains transformer, and that heats my feet by means of heated insoles, oh, these are the which things. you see here. <laughs> this looks a bit like the kind of thing you'd sort of boil your soup on, is that sure? Well, it's the same concept. But it doesn't get as hot, I Not quite as hot, no. but it heats the underneath of the foot in the mm -hmm. same way as a heated mm -hmm. ring of a cooker heats the underneath of a saucepan. Nice and cosy. Hand sewn and on a leather base, very labour intensive and how much, extremely effective. How much would something like this set you back? Well, this is all frightfully expensive because it's produced one at a time. These are £118 a pair the yeah. insoles. Um, the gloves vary between £78 and 120 As you see, they're electrically heated on the back. They're think of, uh, bliss for motorcyclists. I'm sure bliss for many people. Hot hands like that this time of year. Yes. Uh, maybe nurses could benefit from that, do you think? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Hello, what's this, this interesting looking item? Well, that's that a heated mean? breathing mask and Ooh. it protects the wearer against emphysema and bronchitis. And keeps a, a hot face as well. Uh, it preheats the air going into the lungs nice. and prevents you getting all sorts of lung problems. Do you think, I mean, people, I'm sure, have leveled this uh, at you before but uh, people might think you're a bit eccentric <laughs> well you see it's eccentric in so far that it differs from what the rest of the world does but it's all based on very sound good logical engineering basics mm -hmm. and medical basics these are smart that's a pair of heated <laughs> 
and we'll see you. Very nice. Actually, uh, are these my size? I wonder. Would you like to see the heated jacket? I'd I've love to. Off? Should I, I take I, this I, off? I don't know whether we've got time to take Have we got time to take all this off? I don't know. Yeah, we've got a... Oh, minutes. I am most awfully sorry. I forgot the microphone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to short circuit anything with that. Oh. Is there another microphone that'll pick up my speech in the meantime but if I take this off? Leave the jacket on for now then, just in case. I'll tell you something I'd like to ask you. You see, I, I don't wear... I mean, I see you've got long johns here. Yes. These are long... I wear boxer shorts for myself. Now, oh, could yes. You, could you heat these up for me, do you think? Of course, we could even heat those up. <laughs> and how would, what would we do with these? Well, the only thing is the area would be extremely small. And if we were, <laughs> we would have very high concentration of heat to obtain the desired result. But we could do anything. We, I custom make any heated garment that's wanted. Do you think I might lose a little bit of seepage, heatage down, <laughs> down below here? We'd get rather cold legs, wouldn't you, I down would. below? But, what, but what's hot would be, uh, it would, would be very warm. It would be better than that. <laughs> it wouldn't be frightfully good. I'll have to speak to you after the show, then. You don't mind private commissions, though? No, not at all. These are, are you, you wear these kind there of garments, There we have heated long pants, which aren't finished yet. The joints haven't been made, as Did you see. But basically, you see the principle. They're, very, they're quite unobtrusive as well, weren't they? Well, <laughs> Did, <laughs> Did it take you a long time to get dressed in the morning? Uh, a little a little longer than usual, but not very long. So what about when you move from room to room? Do you, you plug yourself in? Well, you see at home, I have a windmill which generates electricity. That's handy. Which handy. nothing in the winter. Right. And I'm able to plug into an umbilical cord in mm. each room. And in that way, I'm able to keep myself warm in any one room at a time. Well, I'm then afraid Then I carry that... a little stored <laughs> heat. <with me. laughs> See the form Very, I'm sure all our fashion fans are going to be rushing out for some of this more. Captain Saddam, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Well, I think it broke down. It's fine. Well, uh, if, uh, if you didn't get warmed up... It's by not Captain all that Saddam, difficult to now... invent something. The problem is convincing people of its worth. And that's the dilemma facing Captain Morris Seddon, an English wireless boffin, who's come up with the idea of heated clothing. The son of an English aristocrat, Seddon came upon hard times and could no longer afford to heat his house. So now he heats himself. They say, have you come from the moon when they see me with trailing wires being plugged in? Because, of course, they're uninformed and they regard it as something novel and something bizarre. Maurice Seddon is the man on the bike. His mother was a German concert pianist who suffered terribly from circulation problems in her hands, a condition her son inherited. As a keen motorcyclist, the captain had two choices, either to hang up his helmet or work out a way to warm the extremities of his body. Well, do come up into my incredibly muddled bachelor dwelling. It's all very dusty and dirty. I think once one's spoiled as a child by lots of servants, one's not particularly predisposed towards cleaning or tidying. You seem to collect a lot of bits and pieces. Well, I can't resist technical junk, you know. I don't even let my neighbours throw it away. What smells so nice here? Well, you see, I am a herbalist. We would say heilpraktiker. You would say possibly quack. Right. And if you look up there, you will see a whole arsenal of over 150 herbs. But you've, of course, come principally to see the heated clothing which we have over here, you see. And what sort of things have you come up with over the years? You've been at it a while. Well, I've invented electrically heated insoles which go under the feet. And they are hand-sewn, an enormous labour of love. They go under the feet. And they cook the underneath of the foot in the same way as an electric cooking ring might cook the underneath of a saucepan. How warm do they get? Well, you wouldn't want them to burn your feet. Oh, no they get pleasantly warm without getting excessively warm. The captain's also designed gloves that his concert pianist mother would have really appreciated. And there's the tracksuits for those very bitter English winters. And for the sufferers of emphysema and bronchitis, of course, a heated mask. Huh? They could be plugged into the electrical power network of any motor vehicle, a motor car, a lorry, a van, a motorcycle, a motor boat, or even a sailing boat that has an auxiliary engine and charging facilities. If, however, you want to be more mobile, a portable battery is all you'll need. Are you wired for warmth now? Well, as you see, I have a wire coming out at the waistline which is labelled feet. And that originates in a pair of these insoles, and that plug corresponds with this plug. 
So you're wearing these at the moment? I'm wearing these under my feet. And during the winter, instead of heating the house, I plug in my heated clothing into the umbilical cord, and I then have the freedom, the autonomy of movement within this particular room, and it keeps me warm using a minimum of energy. I can live in a cold house. Well, these ones look like they've been set up for me. Are these mine? Yes, they're for your use. And they're all turned on? Indeed they are, and plugged in. Oh, very warm, aren't they? They're lovely. I'm glad. What temperature would these be? Well, they would get up to about 40. The captain prefers his bike to the 1934 Rolls Royce he's got stashed in the garage or the 1946 Volkswagen, which looks as if it's put down roots in the garden. And as you've probably noticed, the captain's not opposed to a little advertising either. Quite frankly, he needs the money. My parents were as wealthy as I am very poor, and I was born and brought up in a huge mansion, formerly the property of Sir Edward Elgar, uh, of which the architect was the famous Norman Shaw. Why are you still working? Shouldn't you be a gentleman looking after some country estate? My English father, I regret to tell you, was what we would call in old-fashioned language a cad and bounder. He ran away and left my Franco-German mother with three children in that enormous Elgar house in Hampstead. It was quite vast in about 1936-37 without a penny. So we went from relative prosperity to relative poverty. Um, and I have developed to a high art the means of managing with very little. And the heated clothing is one aspect of this. But gradually, the concept of the use of heated clothing is widening and growing. But it takes time to educate people to a new concept. Well, let's hope that after this, they're a hot selling item in Australia. Thank you very much. Well, I hope for the sake of all those who need it in Australia that you may be right. Andrea Keir with that story, and Captain Seddon hopes to launch his range of heated clothing, which seem quite practical, don't they, here in Australia next Good winter. Good morning, Captain Seddon. Next it's Meredith Vieira from CBS News. Can you squeeze through the gate, not letting the dogs out? Is that all right? Um, I'll try. Or do you want me to appear at the gate? I'm in a dressing gown, and normally I wouldn't appear at the gate before the public, you see. I shall appear before you, but I'd rather not appear before the general public in a dressing gown, unless you particularly want me to fulfil me. Well, no, I want you to do whatever makes you feel most comfortable, right. Captain. Well, then wriggle in, trying not to let the dog die. How is he? And lady. Normally when I come in, they greet me effusively with tremendous barking. And when I leave the premises, they go absolutely berserk. They go rushing round the garden like lunatics, biting at my legs, trying to stop me leave, leaving. They're evidently so fond of me that they're possessive, you see. But last night, they didn't come and greet me at all, and I was mystified. I looked left and right, only to find that they were busy procreating, and they'd got linked, you know, the way dogs do. So no doubt we shall have little puppies in the necessary span of time. His name is Captain Maurice Seddon, and he's been described as an eccentric extraordinaire. The 60-year-old bachelor lives alone, surrounded by a lifetime of accumulated clutter. An inventor by trade, his greatest achievement to date is an entire wardrobe of electrically heated clothing. There you see the heated clothing that is used in the daytime, which is normally not visible because it's worn under outer clothing. Now, this heated clothing is used by paraplegics, neurotics, arthritics, rheumatics, wheelchair cases, polio sufferers, accident victims, the maimed, the infirm, the poor, the aged, people who live alone, creative artists, landscape painters. Oh, I'm getting a little cold. I must close this again. And when I'm in here on my own and not with guests, and when I don't need to heat the house for others, I plug the dressing gown into the umbilical cord, which comes from the windmill, which you've seen out in the garden. It's so adjusted that it progressively gets slowly warmer and warmer and warmer until the point is reached where it is uncomfortably warm. And before that point is reached, of course, you unplug. Seddon was once as rich as he is now poor. When he was a boy, his father abandoned the family, leaving them with a huge house, but without the money to heat it. So a thought came to 10-year-old Maurice. If you can't heat the house, why not heat your body? Does it hurt your feelings that people consider you odd or eccentric? It's rather like water off a duck's back. 
one is so used to people saying, oh, what an unusual person, how eccentric, how strange, how remarkable, look, he has heated clothing. But you know there are many things that in the world are considered bizarre at one moment, and a few years later are completely swallowed and accepted by society and become part and parcel of our daily living. We move on to Captain Murray Seddon. Now, that's a wonderful outfit you've got on, but actually, what is it? It's an electrically heated set of clothing which is used by motorcyclists, paraplegics, sclerotics, arthritics, rheumatics, wheelchair cases, polio sufferers, mm. and countless other people who get cold. I suppose. It it's sort of like, it's like personal central heating, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> it plugs in to a mains transformer, which you see there. Are you going to bend down again? <laughs> Not at the moment. Not at the moment. I've got a bit of gymnastics to do. I'm afraid to pick it all up. We have a mains transformer that it will work off with a mains plug. Equally, it will work off small batteries which can be carried on the waist. You want to sell this, don't you? I can tell. Well, of course, I sell it as well as inventing it. It's useful to many, many people. Well, thank you very much, Captain Seddon. So there you go. What do you think of that? Uh, our next guest uh, subscribes to the old axiom, uh, if you can't lower the bridge, then raise the water. He says... If you can't heat your home, then by all means, heat yourself. That was an old song. Who had that song out? What was it? It was Mitch Ryder in the Detroit. No, it wasn't Lewis. either. Uh, please welcome the inventor of electric clothing, Captain Maurice Seddon. The Captain. Hi, Captain. Pleasure to see you. How do you do? Thank you for being here. You're, uh, you, you were to be with us uh, a week ago, and we ran out of time, and I'm glad you could stay over. Have, have you been to uh, New York before? I've never been to New York mm -hmm. before. This is my first visit. Uh -huh. It's the most interesting place. And where, where is your home? Uh, a place called Datchet, which is a little urbanizing village just outside Windsor. Mm -hmm. And is it, is it so it's near London then, eh? Well, it's about 25 miles out of London yeah. to the west. So, so you're near Windsor Castle? I'm one and a half miles from Windsor Castle. It's a lovely place, isn't it? It's a very beautiful part of the world. Have you ever taken the tour of the castle? Uh, many years ago. Yeah. I'm partly German. When I have German friends who come over, you know, there is a, an unlust, as it were, to take them on a little tour. I see. And uh, <laughs> how, uh, how have you found New York City? Have you enjoyed it? Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, what, have, what have you done in the week you've been here? Well, first of all, I was here for one particular purpose, mm -hmm. to take part in this broadcast, That's right. Nummer Eins. Yeah. And therefore, I concentrated, having heard alarming things in England, about crime and violence right. on preserving myself so that I was able to appear here in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a bad idea, but did you get to do any sightseeing or oh, anything? Yes, indeed. Yeah, An English it? friend took me in his car and we went up the Empire State Building. In a car? <laughs> in a car. I think I, I think I read about that in the Post. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, we're happy to have you here, and uh, electric clothing, well, by the way, captain being a designation of your rank in what branch of the... Regular military? officer, Royal Signals, retired. Mm, okay. I was always labeled a wireless boffin. I'm sorry? A wireless boffin. A wireless boffin? Yes. Uh, uh, now, do they trim the tails on those as well, or...? <laughs> They do. Who knows? Uh, who does know? Who knows? I can't tell. Who knows? Ah, okay. Um, anyway, uh, uh, well, explain to us. I guess everything you're wearing now is electric. Is that right? Well, not everything I'm wearing, uh -huh. but do you want the history of the Yes, thing? I think a little history would be in order. Well, I inherited from my German concert pianist mother the very bad circulation that, unfortunately, concert pianists seem to be bedeviled with. Is that right? Oh, yeah, indeed. They very often are. Ask Sir Georg Scholte, who was on another broadcast with me, and he cried, out in joy with my heated gloves. He said, concert pianists must have this. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's because of that that we made the booking for you here tonight. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, anyway, it, it helps the circulation then. Well, 38 years ago, I either had to give up my beloved motorcycle and many other environment, cold environment activities, mm -hmm. or I had to apply my wireless boffin skills to invent technical solutions to my inherited medical problems. So I did just that. <laughs> All right, and uh, sh show, us, show us now the application of, of uh, how that works. Show us how the electric clothing helps, how you make them, what do you do with them. May I quickly show you the power sources? Mm -hmm. Tonight we're going to be using a mains transformer. All right. A German product which mm -hmm. works on European and on American voltages. All right, good idea. How, much, how much power is uh, being generated there? Well, it provides a 12 volt supply, which mm -hmm. is absolutely safe. There is no possibility of shock. Mm -hmm. And this will simply check whether the power is present. And it, it is. is. We have some AC. 
Yes, we have 12 volts. 12 now, volts. Work on a 12 volt AC transformer. It'll work in my own particular case at home on a wind generator. Wind generator? Indeed. Yeah. Static batteries. Oh, I see. But equally, it if, will if, work... the, if the batteries ever run down, do you have to call the AAA to come out and jump you? <laughs> I haven't had the problem. I haven't had the problem. Equally, we can use these uh, German Sonnenschein gas tight sealed accumulators mm. in portable roll. Mm -hmm. And for the pedestrian who okay, needs okay. heating... Okay, okay, let's just plug something in. Let's go to work here. Battery belt. Battery belt. Now, this right. has a very practical application. In cold weather, you can use this to warm yourself. Indeed. We have a pair of heated gloves, and they've been running for the last few minutes, and we've got a thermometer so in they're, here. they're toasty warm. Would you like, David, to feel this glove? Would I? Just put a hand in. Put your left hand... Left hand in. Oh, how... how uh, okay. I should really have shown... How long has this been on? Oh, about the last five or ten minutes, I suppose. Just slip that on. Well... Ah! There! Ah! Ah! Oh, jeez! Everywhere! No, I, I, I hit a wire! I hit a I, wire! I'm awfully sorry. I'll tell you what has happened here. These things, you see, are intended for use in cold surroundings. Well, yeah. And here we are indoors I don't in warm think the damn thing is grounded. No, no, no. no. You, has, you has this thing been UL approved? You, ha you have not had a shock and you cannot get but a I shock. But I did. I actually got burned. There's I, like sliding my yes. hands into a toaster. May I explain? <laughs> you have not got an electric shock. All right. You cannot get an electric shock to 12 volts. Okay. What has happened? But Is there was actual this? pain. Could there. we zoom in on that thermometer? And you will see that you have 60 degrees centigrade very nearly, which is Which hellish is like hot. 120 Fahrenheit. It, it's uh, about 120 it's Fahrenheit. It's more. It's 135 Fahrenheit. <laughs> now, you see, this, is, this, David, is a completely unrealistic situation. Mm -hmm. You would never, never leave gloves switched on, plugged in, unattended, in a warm building. It's a gross misuse. And that shows what you must not do with heat stove. But for the purpose of the demonstration, we wanted to have it warm for you. So we've learned something. We've made it too warm. Yes. I'm sorry. But yeah. there we well, are. Well, that's all right. I'm now feel it now it's cooled down a bit. Yes, it has cooled down a little bit. And there you see you can perfectly well put your hand into it and it won't hurt you a bit. All right, fine. But, but it has got warmer than it should be. Yeah. Because right, as I, I say, can... never ever do leave it unattended. Yeah, I know, okay. <laughs> Is there a way to control the heat? Do you have like a, a rheostat? Would that do it? In, norm in normal use, you'd simply leave it turned on as long as you wanted it on. Mm -hmm. And when you were warm enough, you'd either unplug it like that, or, that's there we are, taking it off, it, yeah. or you would unplug it at the main supply, whichever you wanted I see, to. I see. Now, when, when you're traveling, I guess you tie a, up a, an awful lot of money in extension cords, right? <laughs> well... Now, supposing you're riding a motorbike... Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have just about a half a minute, so why, right. don't we, why don't we take a look at some of these other applications you here? Can, you can plug in plug the in umbilical your code in the, hall, in the home, you can plug into the umbilical cord, uh -huh. which gives you a certain range of movement. Right. How, uh, now, how much uh, footage do you have on that? How far can you wander plugged in? I honestly am not sure. I think it's about five meters uh -huh. we've got on here. But, but don't you worry about knocking stuff off tables when you... Well... There are slight problems, but uh -huh. if you want the economies that this provides, you oh, have you, to accept You can actually save advantage. money, so you don't have to heat your house at all as long as you have this exactly. electric wardrobe. And what would this cost? We have people in England who die of hypothermia mm -hmm. because they can't afford to heat one room. Right. The energy they this need would to be heat the themselves solution. is right. about a thirtieth of that yeah. energy. And, and I'm guessing that the, the danger of electrocution is, what, minimal? Zero, absolutely zero. <laughs> because we're talking of 12, 12, no, there is no right. doubt about this whatsoever, right. I do assure you. All right, I tell you what, Captain, you know now we're, we're out of time. 77 volts is the minimum for electric shock. This is 12. He just don't care. Heated in so. In the cells, heated insoles under the feet, yeah. hence that. There plug. you go. Yeah, all right. Uh, okay, now we, we really do. He did breathing masks. <laughs> we invalid. really do have to, Captain. We really, we heated really long do. pants. We really do. We have to go now. He did. He did. We, we're, we're out of time now. All right. Thank you very much. Captain, very much. Pleasure to have you here. Very nice to be with you. I've been looking forward to this. Is it your first trip to uh, Los Angeles? It's the first time I've ever been to Los Angeles. Uh -huh. It's a lovely place. 
You spent, uh, what, a couple of days here so far? Yes, I've enjoyed enormously the possibility of being able to swim and bathe and use spa facilities in this climate, in the open air, which is something we certainly can't do in England. Yeah, you only get a couple of months there during the summer when the weather is uh, like I this, right? I think a couple of months is very optimistic, <laughs> I'm afraid. Very optimistic. Now, you, uh, you, I understand, have never seen uh, the show or, or, or me before. I, no, indeed. In fact, I, I don't watch television. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm far too creatively busy, forgive me. But... Oh, <laughs> That's, that's perfectly all right. I don't know you either, Captain. Uh, may I add, is, is the Captain a military title? Is that an honorary title? Or? It's no. It's a regular officer. Royal Signal's retired. Oh, is that right? Yes. Commissioned as long ago as 1946. Well, good. A long time ago. Now, th this is... Uh, how did you get into the uh, electrical clothing business? Well, I was always labeled in Royal Signals the mad boffin or the wireless king who could take your choice. Uh -huh. In other words, I was creatively concerned with electronics and electrics, inventing, designing, creating various things. Mm -hmm. And about 38 years ago, having inherited from my German mother, concert, who was a concert pianist, the problem with circulation, with which unfortunately concert pianists very often have to do, mm -hmm. I got to the situation where I either had to give up my beloved motorcycling and all sorts of open-air activities, or mm -hmm. I had to apply my technical skills to create a solution to the bad circulation. Ah. And so I did exactly that. Well, circulation is certainly important. Oh, it's quite a problem. You never realize how important until you lose it, I suppose. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know. That's a very good point. Uh, is this wearable type of, uh, uh, of clothing? Oh, it's absolutely wearable. Somebody told me that your house, uh, where you live, uh, you, you are an inventor, and I suppose you're into other things besides electric clothing. Indeed. What kind of a, where do you live? Well, I live in a very old, historic, semi-ruinous building, which is, in effect, it's a historic monument. It's the former Dower House to the local moated mansion, mm -hmm. which a long time ago was the manorial seat of the Montagues. Oh. Uh, you may have heard of Lord Montague. Lord, yes, oh yes. Motor Museum fame. Well, mm -hmm. their family long ago had their manorial seat at Datchet in a moated mansion, of which Datchet Cottage is the former dower house. Mm -hmm. It's very old, it's crooked, nothing is 90 degrees, it's all sort of a funny angle like that. Yeah. It's damp, there's no central heating, there are fungi growing in various places. <laughs> Fungi growing on the walls. Oh, absolutely, yes. But they would call that charming, I guess, in oh, England. Oh, quite right? delightful. Quite charming. Very old world. Yeah. It's mildly haunted in uh -huh. quite a harmless way, I assure you. Good show, good and, show. And I've been there for 31 years, though. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Do people come in and visit you there? Or? Oh, yes, indeed, uh -huh. yes. I have a little museum of ancient wireless, mm -hmm. and I keep myself brilliantly warm and very healthy <laughs> by means of electrically heated clothing combined with good herbalism. Ah, so we really came down to the circulation and keeping warm. Now, in England, that makes eminently good sense in England, because you do get some very chill, bone-chilling, damp weather in England, Oh, we right? do. Yeah. So, okay, we are finally back. <laughs> if you just join us, we are talking with um, Captain Maurice Seddon of England, who has invented electric clothing. You were just taking something. You said you had a little horse throat. Uh... Yes, well, I'm a herbalist, amongst other things, and I practice in alternative medical natural herbs? treatments. Of, uh, natural herbs. Good. Absolutely natural. Very good. They make the voice more mellifluous. I always have them for broadcast. Besides. All right, fine. <laughs> well, I, should, I want to be mellifluous at all times. Okay, <laughs> Captain, what do we got? Let's start right off here, and let's show some right. of these things. Electric gloves. Would you like to feel that? Perhaps you'd like to put well, it on. Well, it is very warm. Electrically heated gloves. Now, I suppose you get the old joke about you have to have a long extension cord for these or something to well, plug you in. You can have an extension cord. It depends how you're powering them. So, uh, you can what power are you... them off batteries, which we've, uh, well, we'll come to them later. That's, you can they're them very warm. Mains transformers. This is running on a mains transformer. I see. Now, you carry that transformer? Uh, well, if you're in the house, you have the transformer stationary to provide the power. Uh -huh. If you're walking Why about, would you need the gloves in the house? Wouldn't it be warm in the house? Ah, well, if you're like me, and you live in an old, damp house, and you don't heat it, that's when you need it. With fungus on the walls. With, with fungus, fungus on, the walls. on the walls, all right. And we have people in England who are so poor that they're found dead in their dwellings of hypothermia because uh -huh. they can't afford the cost of heating one room. These gloves could have saved their lives. These gloves could literally have saved their lives. Okay, that's fine. The consumption okay. is minimal, costs much less than any other form of heat. All right, what else do we have here? Well, the next thing I can show you is heated insoles. Heated insoles. And they go into the boots or shoes, under the feet, wire side up. They heat you, and anybody with a bad circulation has immediately perfectly warm feet, even though the house may be quite unheated. I remember going to football games in New York City during the winter where we had a little battery and had electric socks with little wires in the toe portion. 
And they really worked. I believe you. They really worked. This is, of course, an improvement because socks need washing. Socks and insoles do. don't need washing. You never have to wash these little And these are very, huh? very durable indeed. As you see, they're on a leather base. They're very massive. All right. Now, would you sell these if I wanted to buy a pair? What would, what would that cost me? Well, unfortunately, all this stuff is hand-sewn, hand-wired, made one at a time, and one of the problems is it's desperately expensive, so uh -huh. it's not commercially viable in the, co oh, in the competitive sense. These are 150 pounds a pair. Well, the and people who are freezing to death in their homes are not going to be able to go for that, are they? Oh, well, they are, for the yeah. very good reason that once they've bought them, they have a thing which will go for many years and will enormously cut their electricity consumption or their gas consumption, right. so that divided out over the years, it's a big saving. He amortized it over the period of time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Now, what may this be? Well, there you see a heated tracksuit jacket. I think you may possibly call it a jogging. Mm -hmm. And this can be worn by motorcyclists or by invalids, people in wheelchairs, or people like me who live alone and don't want the expense of heating the house. Right. Uh, it all works on 12 volts. It's all perfectly safe. There's absolutely no shock danger, whatever. And, um... Heating all the way down the sleeves, as you can see. All around the back. On the body, front and rear. <laughs> and you just... And, oh, that goes well. and you just hook that into a battery? Yes. You, you, carry can, on carry your... a, you can carry a battery, which I'll show you in a minute. Well, what about your pulling... robes? Somebody says you have a bathrobe that you... Oh, yes. Uh, that, that's at the bottom. Oh, that's, all right. That's last of all. Okay. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Now, we're, we're going to have about another two, two and a half minutes, uh, Captain, so... Tracksuit trousers. Tracksuit trousers to go with the job. Matching, matching <laughs> trousers. That's the battery pack, I suppose. Battery belt can carry up to six batteries. For mobile use for pedestrians. Doesn't that get a little heavy? Uh... It is a problem of weight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could come up with an electric truss or something <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to carry all of that. If you want the advantage, you have to accept the problem. Absolutely. Heated breathing mask. A breathing mask, heated. <laughs> emphysema and bronchitis sufferers and as motorcyclists. Now here is a non-commercial article altogether. This is an antique. It's my own personal 30-year-old much-patched electric dressing gown. I believe they tell me you call it a robe. 30, 30 years old. 30 years old, patched up a thousand times and full of electric heating wires. And there is the power lead bringing in the power. And I use it and its colleague every morning. And for about the first two hours of the day, I wander around my house without needing to get dressed, perfectly warm, electrically heated. Oh, that's very nice. How does Mrs. Seddon feel about all this? Mrs. Seddon, there isn't one. There isn't a Mrs. Seddon. I'm very much a bachelor. No, you... Well, you really don't need one. You're toasty all the time. Captain, it's nice having you here. We've enjoyed uh, talking with you. Uh, we hope you enjoy California. And uh, if I come over to England, can I drop in and see you? Do please. I'll be I over there be for very, Wimbledon. Very glad to see you. And may I say that your juice here, your what do you call it, your grape juice, grape is juice? magnificent. Well, we're glad to hear that. <laughs> Even that is the best you ever Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll be right back with Jim Daniels. Captain Morris Seddon seems a little frightening at first meeting. Covered in wires from his heated clothing, he can often be seen trundling through the sleepy village of Datchet on his old BSA motorbike. Small children don't have to hide, though. The villagers have an affectionate, if curious, view of his lifestyle. Oh, I do not think. I know. It is a fact that I am universally regarded as unusual for the fact that I have plugs trailing from me and I plug in to all manner of things wherever I go. All these things have leads coming out at the waistband, as you see, and those leads are then plugged into the 12-volt source, which may be a battery belt, or in the case of portability for the pedestrian, or in the case of the vehicle, may simply be plugged into a cable, as you see here, with a socket on it, on the handlebar of a motorbike or sprouting out of the dashboard of a car. If one wants the advantages, the undeniably enormous advantages, for the preservation of health and road safety that is provided by heated clothing, then either one dispenses with that advantage or one has to accept the inseparable inconveniences that go along with it, namely the need to be plugged into something, the need to have a 12-volt supply. 
Impractical it may be, but by having sockets all over his home and garden, Seddon can stay warm wherever he goes and never has to heat his house. He even generates his own electricity from a windmill in the garden. Another invention that attracts plenty of comments from the locals is his idiosyncratic rotating visor. You can describe it in simple terms as a wind-driven, centrifugal, windscreen wiper equivalent. It is clearly a major contribution to road safety. People will say to me, have you come from Mars? Uh, are you taking off? Or perhaps you are a helicopter? Uh, now, the majority of people uh, receiving comments of this kind are so appalled, because let's face it, there is a great deal of vanity amongst many people, that they would instantly give up the use of such a device in favour of something conventional, in order not to attract attention. Attracting attention is something Seddon is particularly good at. His gas-propelled Volkswagen has become something of a landmark in the village, and like most of Seddon's things, is covered in old engine oil. Aesthetics take a back seat when it comes to practicality. I'm interested in something which is mechanically absolutely sound and which is made as durable as it possibly can be. And the only way of making ferrous articles last for decades in the humid Anglo-German climate is by coating the ferrous articles with a mixture of dirty, unserviceable uh, uh, engine oil mixed with dirt because this succeeds where plating fails and where painting fails. Don't you get covered in oil? Well, uh, it rather depends, you see. If you, if you take a pair of rubber gloves to get in and out, which I normally would do, and if you're careful what part of the vehicle touches your clothing, on the whole, not. Ask anybody in the village where Seddon lives, and they'll tell you. A roof bristling with aerials and a garden many would call a junkyard are a bit strange as far as the locals are concerned. Appearances, it seems, mean little to Seddon, who thinks nothing of leaving the odd carcass around for his dogs. They know that I've lived here for 32 years, which is longer than most of them, and I think they know the tradition of the, the inventor who lives in this place and of the technology which surrounds him, the antiquarian technology, if you like. I have my own particular ways of doing things. I shall always do them in my own particular ways, and I let other people think what they like to think. That is entirely up to them and of not the slightest interest to me, whatever. I do not disturb anybody, I get on with my own life, and I'm highly constructively busy. I'm always creating, designing, recreating, repairing, modifying or restoring. That is my life, and I enjoy it.